And I am delighted that the very first person to join us on this first edition he is none other than Michael Ignatieff, the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, leader of the Liberal Party. Michael, thank you so much for being here tonight. Great, great to be here, Tom, and the best of luck on this new adventure. Well, thank you so much. You can help me along in that if, uh, if I can throw some questions at you and, and get some answers. You are, in many ways, the man of the literally of the hour right now. The budget amendment vote is going to be coming up shortly. Uh, but you've got a particular problem on your hands right now. You've got at least three of your members from Newfoundland who have publicly said that they are going to defy your order or your position that the Liberals will in fact be voting for this budget. This is your first test of leadership. What are you going to do? The issue here is not me, Tom, with all due respect. The issue is Stephen Harper. Uh, last week, he informed the government of Newfoundland that they were going to get a billion dollars less over the next three years. You can't run a federation like that. He told other provinces that he was changing equalization months ago, but he told Newfoundland last week. So the issue is how Stephen Harper runs this federation. And we think this is a terrible way to run a federation. So I'm going to, just so you know, I'm going to talk to the Prime Minister tonight and say, come on, press the pause button on this. This is a dumb way to, to proceed. And because it's not just about Newfoundland, Tom, it's about the whole way you run the whole country. Get them to pause the, the, the button, get everybody in a room and figure out a better way to run this federation. And, you know, so the ball is in Mr. Harper's court. And yet you've already said, though, that you're going to vote for this budget. Are you now changing your mind on that, that if they don't remove that provision, if they don't press the pause button, that you might withdraw your support for the budget? I'm going to cross those bridges when I have to. It depends on the ball is in Mr. Harper's court. He's got to respond here. He's a minority government. I've said the government's on probation. This is a fundamental issue. As I say to repeat, this is not just about Newfoundland. This is about how we run Canada. And the only way to run Canada is by consent, no surprises, no unilateral moves. And he's making a lot of mistakes at the moment. And we hope that Mr. Harper will see reason, back down, and, and we, we can get a compromise here that allows us to run the Federation properly. But just so I'm absolutely clear on this, are you saying now that there is at least a possibility that you may withdraw your support for this budget? I'm going to have to see how these conversations with Mr. Harper go. I'm not a person to make idle threats. I'm certainly not a man to make threats on television, much as I respect this program. I just want to see what the Prime Minister uh, has to say to a perfectly sensible idea, which is that we press the pause button on a unilateral measure imposed on a province that has implications for the whole of Canada. Let's just, let's take time out here and do this right. And then, you know, if he, if he says no, then I'm in another situation and I'll cross that bridge when I have to. Fair enough. Let's back off a little bit and, and, and take a look at what you said were empty threats and, and the need not to make empty threats. Uh, there's been a lot of that in this place for the last number of months. Can we continue on with an opposition, whether it be a single party or whether it be some form of, co of a coalition, which I suspect is probably dead and I think everybody believes that now, but nevertheless has the time come and gone for the huffing and puffing but not blowing the house down? In Tom, other words, if you make the threat, you got to do it. Oh, sure, sure. I'd lose credibility if I make threats I'm not prepared to execute. That's why I didn't make a threat. I just said, I'm discussing with the Prime Minister doing my job. I think Canadians are saying to us right across the board, and I think it's good to say this on your first program, let's raise our game. Let's ask real questions in the House of Commons and seek real answers. Let us see whether there are times when we can cooperate. Let's do our job as opposition, which is hold these guys' feet to the fire. We're trying to do that. Uh, because we're not in normal times, Tom. We're in a, in a crisis where everywhere I go across Canada, people are saying one thing to me. They're saying, I can't touch the bottom here. I don't know where the bottom is. And that creates anxiety, that creates fear. And our job as politicians is to provide some assurance that we're trying to, trying to do this right for them. You know, I suspect that what you're also hearing when you travel out there is, who are you? Uh, a lot of people know you by name, they know how you look, uh, but they don't know a lot about you. Now, I would recommend to anybody, if you can find the New York Times from the weekend lying around, uh, there's an article on you in the New York Times. I suspect, in fact, the New York Times is a little bit sweet on you, uh, having read that article. Uh, 
but let's examine this a little bit. Uh, you have got a most unusual history for a Canadian political leader. Uh, you're an author, you're a writer, you're an intellectual, you used to be a TV host, you wrote movie scripts, you wrote TV scripts. There's not much that you, that you really haven't done. The article in the New York Times started off, though, with a really interesting quote, and it said that you had been sending emails in the past couple of years to friends around the world, uh, bemoaning how boring your life had become. Presumably, you were talking about this place. Really? Is it all that absolutely. boring? I have absolutely no recollection, Tom, <laughs> of ever saying Canada was boring to anybody, email or otherwise. Yeah. And um, the one thing I can say with confidence, this is the most exciting period of my life without any question and this is the most exciting time to exercise leadership because it's all tough out there it's real tough it's tough for Canadians and they want leaders who are up to the challenge okay you were quoted in that New York Times article and I want to call this up on the screen now so everybody can read it Leon Wiesalter he yeah. is the, uh, the from the New Republic cited in it he says referring to you he is in spirit a humanist not a politician he has a hunger for intellectual authority and for a certain degree of social recognition, but it was never about power. <laughs> Pretty funny quote. Look, look, let's, let's cut to the chase. If, if you're the leader of the opposition uh, and you're in the Parliament of Canada, you would like to exercise power one day if the people of Canada, the people watching this program, think that's a good idea. So, of course, it's about power. It wasn't about power when I was talking to Leon, but but of course it's about power and then it's a matter of exercising power responsibly when did you discover power that you wanted it um, I don't Tom I, I don't think people want power for itself I would love to be able to do some things for this country I'd like to make sure that we had childcare and early childhood learning for every Canadian child I'd like us to have national energy grids that tie the country together I'd like us when we get to 2017 the 150th anniversary of our country, we have a hell of a party and reaffirm our identity and our strength as a country. Can I those, just are, those are concrete things that I would like to use power for. Well, now, since you were the one that brought up the party, let me show you one other quote that was in the New York Times article. Can we go to it now? This is from your friend Bob Ray, who says, if it had been a broader election, meeting the leadership campaign that you won, if it had been a broader election throughout the party, I would have won, says Bob Ray, your foreign affairs critic. Is he right? Uh, Bob is uh, doing what's called uh, asking a retrospective hypothetical, a hypothetical about the past. That sounds painful. It didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't happen. Look, it didn't happen. Bob and I were competitors. We're now working together daily. Uh, we're, we were leading the attack in the House of Commons today on this government's terrible stance on American protectionism. We're working hand in glove every day. Uh, he's a wonderful colleague. Uh, and um, Still says he could whip you in the back alley. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure he thinks that because we're, you know, it, it's a, politics is competitive and I respect he's a great competitor. What can I say? Michael Ignatiev, thanks so much for being with us today. I've really enjoyed it. My pleasure, Tom. Thank thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank you.